Chapter 6, Other Methods. D, which method is the best? B, that depends on the temperament of the individual. Every person is born with the samskaras, characteristics or tendencies, from his past lives. One method will prove easy to one person and another to another. There can be no general rule. In the following passage, Bhagavan indicates the purpose of all the methods, and the goal they aim at. There are many methods. You may practice self-inquiry, asking yourself who am I? Or if that does not appeal to you, you may meditate on I am Brahman, or some other theme, or you may concentrate on an incantation or do invocation. The object in every case is to make the mind one-pointed, to concentrate it on one thought and thereby exclude the many other thoughts. If we do this, the one thought also eventually goes and the mind is extinguished at its source. Dr. Masalawala placed in Bhagavan's hands a letter he had received from his friend V. K. Ajgayankar, a gentleman of about 35, a follower of Jnane's War Maharaj, who is said to have attained Jnana in his 28th year. The letter said, You call me Purna. Who is not Purna in this world? Bhagavan agreed and, continuing in the vein in which he discoursed this morning, said, we first limit ourselves and then seek to become unlimited, as in fact we always are. All our effort is only directed to giving up the notion that we are limited. The letter went on to say, Ramana Maharshi is an exponent of the Ajata doctrine of Advaita Vedanta. Of course it is a bit difficult. Bhagavan remarked on this, somebody has told him so. I do not teach only the Ajata doctrine. I approve of all schools. The same truth has to be expressed in different ways to suit the capacity of the hearer. The Ajata doctrine says, nothing exists except the one reality. There is no birth or death, no projection or drawing in, no striving, no aspirant, no release, no bondage, no liberation. The one unity alone exists forever. To such as find it difficult to grasp this truth and to ask, how can we ignore this solid world we see all around us? The dream experience is pointed out and they are told, all that you see depends upon the seer. Apart from the seer, there is no scene. This is called Drishti Rishti Vada or the argument that one first creates everything out of his mind and then sees what his mind has created. To such as cannot grasp even this and who further argue, the dream experience is so short while the world always exists. The dream experience was limited to me, but the world is felt and seen not only by me, but by so many, and we cannot call such a world non-existent. The argument called Srishti Drishti Vadu is addressed and they are told, God first created such and such a thing, out of such and such an element, and then something else and so forth. That alone will satisfy this class. Their mind is otherwise not satisfied and they ask themselves, how can all geography, all maps, all sciences, stars, planets, and the rules governing or relating to them all be totally untrue? To such it is best to say, yes, God created all this and so you see it. Dr. Masalawala objected, but all these teachings cannot be true. Only one doctrine can be true. Bhagavan said, all these viewpoints are only to suit the capacity of the learner. The Absolute can only be one. However, although Bhagavan approved of other paths for those who could not follow self-inquiry, he did say to the present writer, all other methods lead up to self-inquiry. If a devotee of his found that some other, less direct path served him better, Bhagavan would guide him on this until he could gradually bring him to self-inquiry. Talking of the innumerable ways of different seekers after God, Bhagavan said, each should be allowed to go his own way, the way for which he alone may be built. It will not do to convert him to another path by violence. The Guru will go with the disciple along his own path and then gradually turn him into the supreme path when the time is ripe. Suppose a car is going at top speed. To stop it and to turn it at once would lead to a crash. Other methods are not necessarily exclusive of self-inquiry, in fact some of them may very well be combined with it. Subject, S.A.T. Sang. 
the greatest of all aids to self-realization is the presence of a realized man. This is called satsang which means literally fellowship with being. Even here Bhagavan would sometimes explain that the real being is the self and therefore no physical form is needed for satsang. Nevertheless, he often dwelt on its benefits. Association with sages who have realized the truth removes material attachments, on these attachments being removed, the attachments of the mind are also destroyed. Those whose attachments of mind are thus destroyed become one with that which is motionless. They attain liberation while yet alive. Cherish association with such sages. That supreme state which is obtained here and now as a result of association with sages, and realized through the deep meditation of self inquiry in contact with the heart, cannot be gained with the aid of a guru or through knowledge of the scriptures, or by spiritual merit, or by any other means. If association with sages is obtained, to what purpose are the various methods of self discipline? Tell me, of what use is a fan when the cool, gentle south wind is blowing? The heat of mental and bodily excitement is ill aid by the rays of the moon, wanton misery are removed by the Kalpaka tree, sins are washed away by the sacred water of the Ganges. But all these afflictions are altogether banished by the mere darshan of the peerless sage. Neither the holy waters of pilgrimage nor the images of gods made of earth and stone can stand comparison with the benign look of the sage. These purify one only after countless days of grace, but no sooner does the sage bestow his gracious glance than he purifies one. It should be mentioned that these five verses were not actually composed by Bhagavan but translated from Sanskrit for inclusion in his supplementary forty verses. The statement in the second verse that such grace cannot be gained with the aid of guru is using the word guru in its lower sense of teacher, otherwise it would have the same meaning as sage and the comparison would be pointless. Subject Breath Control Breath control can have various meanings. It can be retention of breath, or regulation of breathing according to a definite rhythm, or merely watching the breathing and remaining attentive to it. The Maharshi often authorized the use of breath control, but did not as a rule specify what form it was to take, perhaps because those who asked for his authorization were usually practicing a form of it prescribed by some guru and merely wished to know whether they could continue to do so. He himself, although competent to authorize any practice, did not teach or prescribe the more technical forms of breath control. As there are elaborate treatises on the elements of Ashtanga Yoga only as much as is necessary is written here. Anyone who desires to know more must resort to a practicing yogi with experience and learn from him in detail. When he did specify what kind of breath control was to be practiced it was usually just watching the breath, the type which is least likely to be harmful if practiced without guidance from a guru who specializes in this kind of technical, indirect path. Mr. Prasat asked whether the regular form of breath control is not better, in which breathing in, holding the breath, and breathing out are to the rhythm of 1 to 4 colon 2. Bhagavan replied, all such rhythms, sometimes regulated not by counting but by incantations, are aids for controlling the mind, that is all. Watching the breath is also one form of breath control. Holding the breath is more violent and may be harmful when there is no proper guru to guide the practicer at every step, but merely watching the breath is easier and involves no risk. The Maharshi was careful in authorizing breath control to explain why it was used, that it was helpful simply as a step towards mind control. The principle underlying the system of yoga is that the source of thought is also the source of breath and the vital force. Therefore if one of them is effectively controlled the other is also automatically brought under control. The source of the mind is the same as that of the breath and the vital forces. It is really the multitude of thoughts that constitute the mind, and the I-thought is the primal thought of the mind and is itself the ego. But breath too has its origin at the same place whence the ego rises. Therefore, when the mind subsides, breath and the vital forces also subside, and conversely when the latter subside, the former also subsides.
breath and vital forces are also described as the gross manifestations of the mind. Till the hour of death the mind sustains and supports these forces in the physical body, and when life becomes extinct, the mind envelops them and carries them away. During sleep, however, the vital forces continue to function, although the mind is not manifest. This is according to the divine law and is intended to protect the body and to remove any possible doubt as to whether it is alive or dead while one is asleep. Without such arrangement by nature sleeping bodies would often be cremated alive. The vitality apparent in breathing is left behind by the mind as a watchman. But in the wakeful state and in samadhi, when the mind subsides, breath also subsides. For this reason, because the mind has the sustaining and controlling power over breath and vital forces, and is therefore ulterior to both of them, the practice of breath control is merely helpful in subduing the mind, but it cannot bring about its final extinction. It follows from this that breath control, as authorized by Sri Bhagavan, is necessary only for those who cannot control the mind directly. d. Is it necessary to control one's breath? b. Breath control is only an aid for diving inwards. One can as well dive down by controlling the mind. On the mind being controlled, the breath is automatically controlled. There is no need to practice breath control. Mind control is enough. Breath control is recommended for the person who cannot control his mind directly. This implies that Sri Bhagavan did not authorize breath control as an independent technique, but only as an approach towards mind control. In itself he warned that its effects were impermanent. For the subsidence of the mind there is no other means more effective and adequate than self-inquiry. Even though by other means the mind subsides, that is only apparently so, it will rise again. For instance, the mind subsides by means of breath control, yet such subsidence lasts only so long as the control of breath and vital forces continues, and when they are released the mind also gets released and immediately, being externalized, it continues to wander through the force of subtle tendencies. Therefore, those who use it on the path prescribed by the Mahasi should also know when to give it up. b. Breath control is a help in controlling the mind and is advised for such as find they cannot control the mind without some such aid. For those who can control their mind and concentrate, it is not necessary. It can be used at the beginning until one is able to control the mind but then it should be given up. Another reason for caution in the use of breath control is that it may lead to subtle experiences which can distract the seeker from his true goal. As will be shown in the next chapter, Bhagavan always warned against interest in powers and experiences or desire for them, he sometimes specifically connected this warning with the use of breath control. B. Breath control is also a help. It is one of the various methods that are intended to help us attain ekagrata or an appointedness of mind. Breath control can also help to control the wandering mind and attain this one-pointedness and therefore it can be used. But one should not stop there. After obtaining control of the mind through breath control, one should not rest content with any experiences which may accrue therefrom but should harness the controlled mind to the question, Who am I? till the mind merges in the self. Subject, Asanas It was usual for devotees of Bhagavan to sit cross-legged in meditation before him, but the more elaborate yogic postures or asanas were not practiced. As explained in the previous chapter, such postures are less important in self-inquiry than on a yogic path. d. A number of asanas are mentioned. Which of them is the best? b. One-pointedness of mind is the best posture. Subject, Hatha Yoga. b. The Hatha Yogis claim to keep the body fit so that the inquiry may be effected without obstacles. They also say that life must be prolonged so that the inquiry may be carried to a successful end. Furthermore there are those who use various drugs, Kyakalpa, to that end. Their favorite example is that the canvas must be perfect before the painting is begun. Yes, but which is the canvas and which the painting? According to them the body is the canvas and the inquiry into the self the painting. 
But isn't the body itself a picture on the canvas of the self? D. But Hatha Yoga is much spoken of as an aid. B. Yes. Even great pandits well versed in Vedanta continue the practice of it. Otherwise their minds will not subside. So you may say it is useful for those who cannot otherwise still the mind. Subject. Light gazing. D. Why should one not adopt other means, such as gazing at a light? B. Light gazing stupefies the mind and produces catalepsy of the will for the time being, but it produces no permanent benefit. Subject, Concentration on Sound There are those who concentrate on the hearing of a sound, not any physical sound but sound from the subtle plane. The Maharshi did not disapprove of this but reminded them to hold on to the self and find out who it is that hears the sound. The concentration achieved is good but does not in itself lead far enough. Inquiry also is needed. A Gujarati gentleman said that he was concentrating on sound, nada, and desired to know if the method was right. B. Meditation on nada is one of the various approved methods. Its adherents claim a very special virtue for it. According to them it is the easiest and most direct method. Just as a child is lulled to sleep by lullabies, so Nada soothes one to the state of Samadhi. Again, just as a king sends his state musicians to welcome his son on his return from a long journey, so also Nada takes the devotee into the Lord's abode in a pleasing manner. Nada helps concentration, but after it begins to be felt, the practice should not be made an end in itself. Nada is not the objective, the subject should firmly be held otherwise a blank will result. Though the subject is there even in the blank one must remember his own self. Nadan Upasna, meditation on sound, is good, it is better if associated with self-inquiry. Subejkt, concentration on the heart or between the eyebrows. Concentration on the point between the eyebrows is a yogic practice. Bhagavan recognized its efficacy, especially, when combined with incantation, but recommended concentration on the heart on the right side as being both safer and more effective. A Maharashtra lady of middle age, who had studied Jnanes Wari and Vikara Sagara, and was practicing concentration between the eyebrows, had felt shivering and fear and did not progress. She required guidance. The Maharshi told her not to forget the seer. The sight is fixed between the eyebrows but the seer is not kept in view. If the seer be always remembered it will be all right. A visitor said, we are asked to concentrate on the spot in the forehead between the eyebrows. Is that right? B. Everyone is aware that he exists. Yet one ignores that awareness and goes about in search of God. What is the use of fixing one's attention between the eyebrows? The aim of such advice is to help the mind to concentrate. It is one of the forcible methods of checking the mind and preventing its dissipation. The mind is forcibly directed into one channel and this is a help to concentration. But the method of realization is the inquiry, who am I? The present trouble affects the mind and it can only be removed by the mind. D. Sri Bhagavan speaks of the heart as the seat of consciousness and as identical with the self. What exactly does the word heart signify? B. The question about the heart arises because you are interested in seeking the source of consciousness. To all deep thinking minds, the inquiry about the I and its nature has an irresistible fascination. Call it by any name, God, Self, the heart or the seat of consciousness, it is all the same. The point to be grasped is this, that heart means the very core of one's being, the center without which there is nothing whatever. D. But Sri Bhagavan has specified a particular place for the heart within the physical body, that is in the chest, two digits to the right of the median. B, yes, that is the center of spiritual experience according to the testimony of sages. The spiritual heart center is quite different from the blood propelling, muscular organ known by the same name. The spiritual heart center is not an organ of the body. 
All that you can say of the heart is that it is the core of your being, that with which you are really identical, as the word in Sanskrit literally means, whether you are awake, asleep or dreaming, whether you are engaged in work or immersed in samadhi. d. In that case, how can it be localized in any part of the body? Fixing a place for the heart would imply setting physiological limitations to that which is beyond space and time. b. That is right. But the person who puts the question about the position of the heart considers himself as existing with or in the body. While putting the question now, would you say that your body alone is here but that you are speaking from somewhere else? No, you accept your bodily existence. It is from this point of view that any reference to a physical body comes to be made. Truly speaking, pure consciousness is indivisible, it is without parts. It has no form or shape, no within or without. There is no right or left. Pure consciousness, which is the heart, includes all, and nothing is outside or apart from it. That is the ultimate truth. D. How shall I understand Sri Bhagavan's statement that the experience of the heart center is at that particular place in the chest? b. Pure consciousness wholly unrelated to the physical body and transcending the mind is a matter of direct experience. Sages know their bodiless, eternal existence, just as an unrealized man knows his bodily existence. But the experience of consciousness can be with bodily awareness as well as without it. In the bodiless experience of pure consciousness the sage is beyond time and space, and no question about the position of the heart can arise at all. Since, however, the physical body cannot subsist, with life, apart from consciousness, bodily awareness has to be sustained by pure consciousness. The former, by nature, is limited and can never be coextensive with the latter which is infinite and eternal. Body consciousness is merely a miniature reflection of the pure consciousness with which the sage has realized his identity. For him, therefore, body consciousness is only a reflected ray, as it were, of the self-effulgent, infinite consciousness which is himself. It is in this sense alone that the sage is aware of his bodily existence. d. For men like me, who have neither the direct experience of the heart nor the consequent recollection, the matter seems to be somewhat difficult to grasp. About the position of the heart itself, perhaps, we must depend upon some sort of guesswork. b. If the determination of the position of the heart is to depend on guesswork even in the case of the unrealized, the question is surely not worth much consideration. No, it is not on guesswork that you have to depend, it is an unerring intuition. d. Who has the intuition? b. All people. d. Does Bhagavan credit me with an intuitive knowledge of the heart? b. No, not of the heart but of the position of the heart in relation to your identity. D. Sri Bhagavan says that I intuitively know the position of the heart in the physical body? B. Why not? D. Pointing to himself, it is to me personally that Bhagavan is referring? B. Yes. That is the intuition. How did you refer to yourself by gesture just now? Did you not put your finger on the right side of the chest? That is exactly the place of the heart center. D. So then, in the absence of direct knowledge of the heart center, I have to depend on this intuition? B. What is wrong with it? When a schoolboy says, it is either did the sum correctly, or when he asks you, shall I run and get the book for you, would he point to the head that did the sum correctly or to the legs that will swiftly get you that book? No, in both cases. His finger is pointed quite naturally towards the right side of the chest, thus giving innocent expression to the profound truth that the source of Inus in him is there. It is an unerring intuition that makes him refer to himself, to the heart which is the self, in that way. The act is quite involuntary and universal, that is to say, it is the same in the case of every individual. What stronger proof than this do you require about the position of the heart center in the physical body? d. But the question is, which is the correct view of the two, namely, 1. That the center of spiritual experience is the place between the eyebrows, or, 2. That it is the heart. b. 
for the purpose of practice you may concentrate between the eyebrows if you like, it would then be bhavana or imaginative contemplation of the mind, whereas the supreme state of a new bhava or realization, with which you become wholly identified and in which your individuality is completely dissolved, transcends the mind. Then, there can be no objectified center to be experienced by you as a subject distinct and separate from it. D. I would like to put my question in slightly different words. Can the place between the eyebrows be said to be the seat of the self? B. You agree that the self is the ultimate source of consciousness and that it subsists equally during all the three states of mind. But see what happens when a person in meditation is overcome by sleep. As the first symptom of sleep his head begins to nod, but this could not happen if the self were situated between the eyebrows, that centre cannot be called its seat without implying that the self often forsakes its own place, which is absurd. The fact is that the sad dark may have his experience at any centre or chakra on which he concentrates his mind, but that does not make such a centre the seat of the self. D. Since Bhagavan says that the self may function at any of the centers or chakras while its seat is in the heart, is it not possible that by the practice of intense concentration or dhyana between the eyebrows, this center may itself become the seat of the self? b. As long as it is merely the stage of practice of concentration in order to control your attention at one spot, any consideration about the seat of the self would merely be theorizing. You consider yourself the subject the seer, and the place whereon you fix the attention becomes the object seen. This is merely bhavana. When, on the contrary, you see the seer himself, you merge in the self, you become one with it, that is the heart. d. Then, is the practice of concentration between the eyebrows advisable? b. The final result of the practice of any kind of dhyana is that the object on which the aspirant fixes his mind ceases to exist as distinct and separate from the subject. Subject and object become one self, and that is the heart. The practice of concentration on the center between the eyebrows is one of the methods of training, and thereby thoughts are effectively controlled for the time being. The reason is that all thought is an outer activity of the mind, and thought, in the first instance, follows sight, physical or mental. It is important, however, that this practice of fixing one's attention between the eyebrows should be accompanied by incantations. Because next in importance to the eye of the mind is the ear of the mind, that is mental visualization of speech either to control and thereby strengthen the mind, or to distract and thereby dissipate it. Therefore, while fixing the mind's eye on a center, as for instance, between the eyebrows, you should also practice the mental articulation of a divine name or incantation. Otherwise you will soon lose hold on the object of concentration. This kind of practice leads to the identification of the name, word or self whatever you may call it, with the center selected for the purpose of meditation. Pure consciousness, the self or the heart is the final realization. Subject the Sahasrara. Tantric paths teach the gradual uncoiling of the Kundalini or spiritual current in a man. As it uncoils and rises upwards, it enfranchises a series of chakras or spiritual centers in the body each bestowing its own powers and perceptions until it culminates in the sahasrara or thousand-petaled lotus in the brain or the crown of the head. When asked about this, Bhagavan replied that, whatever the experience may be, the ultimate seat of the self, and therefore of realization, is the heart. d. Why doesn't Sri Bhagavan direct us to practice concentration on some particular center or chakra? b. The Yoga Sastras say that the Sahasrara or brain is the seat of the self. The Purusha or Sukta declares that the heart is its seat. To enable the aspirant to steer clear of any possible doubt, I tell him to take up the thread or the clue of Inus and follow it to its source. Because, firstly it is impossible for anybody to entertain any doubt about this I notion, secondly, Whatever be the means adopted, the final goal is realization of the source of I amness, which is what you begin from in your experience. If you, therefore, practice self-inquiry, you will reach the heart which is the self. d. 
Does the Giovanardi, subtle nerve column, really exist or is it a figment of the imagination? b. The yogis say that there is a nadi called the Jivanadi, Atmanadi or Paranadi. The Upanishads speak of a center from which thousands of nadis branch off. Some locate this in the brain and others in other places. The Garbhapanishad traces the formation of the fetus and the growth of the child in the womb. The ego is considered to enter the child through the fontanelle in the seventh month of its growth. In evidence thereof it is pointed out that the fontanelle is tender in a baby and is also seen to pulsate. It takes some months for it to ossify. Thus the ego comes from above, enters through the fontanelle and works through thousands of nadis which are spread over the whole body. Therefore the seeker of truth must concentrate on the sahasrara, that is the brain, in order to regain his source. Breath control is said to help the yogi to rouse the Kundalini Shakti which lies coiled in the solar plexus. The Shakti rises through a nerve called the Sushama, which is embedded in the core of the spinal cord and extends to the brain. If one concentrates on the Sahasrara there is no doubt that the ecstasy of Samadhi ensues. The Vasanas, that is the latencies, are however, not destroyed. The yogi is therefore bound to wake up from Samadhi because the release from bondage is not yet accomplished. He must still try to eradicate the vasanas in order that the latent tendencies yet inherent in him may not disturb the peace of his Samadhi. So he passes down from the Sahasrara to the heart through what is called the Jivanadi, which is only a continuation of the Sushama. The Sushama is thus a curve. It starts from the solar plexus rises through the spinal cord to the brain and from the bends down and ends in the heart. When the yogi has reached the heart, samadhi becomes permanent. Thus we see that the heart is the final center. Some Upanishads also speak of a hundred and one nadis which spread from the heart, one of them being the vital nadi. If the ego descends from above and is reflected in the brain, as the yogis say, there must be a reflecting surface. This must also be capable of limiting the infinite consciousness to the limits of the body. In short, the universal being becomes limited as an ego. Such a reflecting medium is furnished by the aggregative vasanas of the individual. It acts like the water in a pot which reflects an object. If the pot is drained of its water there will be no reflection. The object will remain without being reflected. The object here is the universal being consciousness which is all-pervading and therefore immanent in all. It need not be cognized by reflection alone. It is self-resplendent. Therefore, the seeker's aim must be to drain away the vasanas from the heart and let no reflecting medium obstruct the light of the eternal consciousness. This is achieved by the search for the origin of the ego and by diving into the heart. This is the direct path to self-realization. One who adopts it need not worry about nadis, brain, sushama, kundalini, breath control and the six yogic centers. The self does not come from anywhere nor does it enter the body through the crown of the head. It is as it is, ever shining, ever steady, unmoving and unchanging. The changes which are noticed are not inherent in the self for the self abides in the heart and is self-luminous like the sun. The changes are seen in its light. The relationship between the self and the body or the mind may be compared to that of a clear crystal and its background. If the crystal is placed against a red flower it shines red, if against green it shines green, and so on. The individual confines himself to the limits of the changeable body or of the mind which derives its existence from the unchanging self. All that is necessary is to give up this mistaken identity and, that done, the ever-shining self will be seen to be the single, non-dual reality. Subject, Silence On the whole, the Maharshi did not approve of vows of silence. If the mind is controlled, Useless speech will be avoided, but abjuring speech will not quieten the mind. The effect cannot produce the cause. D. Isn't a vow of silence helpful? B. A vow is only a vow. It may help meditation to some extent, but what is the use of keeping the mouth shut and letting the mind run riot? 
If the mind is engaged in meditation, what need is there for speech? Nothing is as good as meditation. What is the use of a vow of silence if one is engrossed in activity? Subject Diet In general, although attaching little importance to physical aids to meditation, the Mahasi was insistent on the advantages of limiting oneself to sattvic, that is vegetarian and non-stimulating food. Regulation of diet, restricting it to sattvic food, taken in moderate quantities, is the best of all rules of conduct and the most conducive to the development of sattvic, pure, qualities of mind. These in turn help one in the practice of self-inquiry. The following is the conclusion of self-inquiry, the first book that he wrote. It is within our power to adopt a simple and nutritious diet and, with earnest and incessant endeavor, to eradicate the ego, the cause of all misery, by stopping all mental activity born of the ego. Can obsessing thoughts arise without the ego, or can there be illusion apart from such thoughts? He also confirmed this when asked by devotees. D. Are there any aids to, 1, concentration, and, 2, casting off distractions? B. Physically, the digestive and other organs are to be kept free from irritation. Therefore food is regulated both in quantity and quality. Non-irritants are eaten, avoiding chilies, excess of salt, onions, wine, opium, and so on. Avoid constipation, drowsiness and excitement and all foods which induce them. Mentally, take interest in one thing and fix the mind on it. Let that interest be self-absorbing to the exclusion of everything else. This is dispassion, vairagya, and concentration. Mrs. Piggott returned from Madras for a further visit and asked questions concerning diet. Mrs. P. What diet is suitable for a person engaged in spiritual practice? B. Sattvic food in moderate quantities. Mrs. P. What food is sattvic? B. Bread, fruit, vegetables, milk and such things. Mrs. P. Some people in the north eat fish. Is that permissible? To this question Bhagavan did not reply. He was always reluctant to criticize others and this question was inviting him either to do so or to change what he had said. Mrs. P. We Europeans are accustomed to a particular diet and change of diet affects the health and weakens the mind. Isn't it necessary to keep up physical health? B. Quite necessary. The weaker the body, the stronger the mind grows? Mrs. P. In the absence of our usual diet our health suffers and the mind loses strength. It will be noticed that Bhagavan and Mrs. Piggott were using the term strength of mind in different meanings. By strong Bhagavan was meaning ungovernable, whereas Mrs. Piggott was meaning powerful. Therefore the next question, which enabled her to put her point of view. B. What do you mean by strength of mind? Mrs. P the power to eliminate worldly attachment. b. The quality of one's food influences the mind. The mind feeds on the food consumed. Mrs. P. Really? But how can Europeans accommodate themselves to sattvic food? b. Turning to Mr. Evans went, you have been taking our food. Does it inconvenience you at all? e. w. No, because I am accustomed to it. b. Custom is only an adjustment to environment. It is the mind that matters. The fact is that the mind has been trained to find certain foods good and palatable. The necessary food value is obtainable in vegetarian as well as non-vegetarian food, only the mind desires the sort of food that it is used to and which it considers palatable. Mrs. P. Do these restrictions apply to the realized man also? B. He is stabilized and not influenced by the food he takes. It was very characteristic of Bhagavan that, although he would answer questions about diet quite firmly when asked, he would not enjoin a vegetarian diet on any devotee who did not ask him. It was also characteristic that, under his silent influence, it would sometimes happen that one who did not ask would gradually begin to feel an aversion to meat food and an inclination to change over to a purer diet. Just as Bhagavan disapproved of all extremes, so he disapproved of fasting. 
D. Can fasting help towards realization? B. Yes, but it is only a temporary help. It is mental fasting that is the real aid. Fasting is not an end in itself. There must be spiritual development at the same time. Absolute fasting weakens the mind too and leaves you without sufficient strength for the spiritual quest. Therefore eat in moderation and continue the quest. D. They say that 10 days after breaking a month's fast the mind becomes pure and steady and remains so forever. B. Yes, but only if the spiritual quest has been kept up right through the fast. Subject Celibacy There is no need to say much about celibacy, since it has been dealt with in an earlier chapter. It is normal in India that all those who do not renounce the world to become sadhus marry. Bhagavan always insisted that Brahmacharya is living constantly in Brahman. He did not encourage formal adoption of the saffron garb, external sannyasa. He neither enjoyed nor discouraged celibacy, though occasionally he did evince interest in births and marriages among the devotees. Subject Bhakti We come now to Bhakti Marga, the path of love and devotion, worship and surrender. This is usually considered the very antithesis of self-inquiry, since it is based on the presumption of duality, of worshipper and worshipped, lover and beloved. Whereas self-inquiry presumes non-duality. Therefore theorists are apt to presume that if one is based on truth the other must be based on error, and in expounding one they only too often condemn the other. Bhagavan not only recognized both these paths but guided his followers on them both. He often said, there are two ways, ask yourself, who am I? Or surrender. Many of his followers chose the latter way. D. What is unconditional surrender? B. If one surrenders completely, there will be no one left to ask questions or to be considered. Either the thoughts are eliminated by holding on to the root thought, I, or one surrenders unconditionally to the higher power. These are the only two ways to realization. Self-inquiry dissolves the ego by looking for it and finding it to be non-existent, whereas devotion surrenders it, therefore both come to the same ego-free goal, which is all that is required. b. There are only two ways to conquer destiny or to be independent of it. One is to inquire whose this destiny is and to discover that only the ego is bound by it and not the self and that the ego is non-existent. The other way is to kill the ego by completely surrendering to the Lord, realizing one's helplessness and saying all the time, not I, but thou, O Lord, giving up all sense of I and mine and leaving it to the Lord to do what he likes with you. Surrender can never be regarded as complete so long as the devotee wants this or that from the Lord. True surrender is the love of God for the sake of love and nothing else not even for the sake of salvation. In other words, complete effacement of the ego is necessary to conquer destiny, whether you achieve this effacement through self-inquiry or through Bhakti Marga. The spark of spiritual knowledge, Jnana, will consume all creation like a mountain heap of cotton. Since all the countless worlds are built upon the weak or non-existent foundations of the ego, they all disintegrate when the atom bomb of knowledge falls on them. All talk of surrender is like stealing sugar from a sugar image of Gainshore and then offering it to the same Gainshore. You say that you offer up your body and soul and all your possessions to God, but were they yours to offer? At best you can say, I wrongly imagined till now that all these, which are yours, were mine. Now I realize that they are yours and I shall no longer act as though they were mine. And this knowledge that there is nothing but God or the self, that I and mine do not exist and that only the self exists, is Jnana. He often explained however, that true devotion is devotion to the self and therefore it comes to the same as self-inquiry. It is enough that one surrenders oneself. Surrender is giving oneself up to the original cause of one's being. Do not delude yourself by imagining this source to be some god outside you. One's source is within oneself give yourself up to it. That means that you should seek the source and merge in it. Because you imagine yourself to be out of it, you raise the question, where is the source? 
Some contend that just as sugar cannot taste its own sweetness for there must be someone to taste and enjoy it. So an individual cannot both be the supreme and also enjoy the bliss of that state. Therefore the individuality must be maintained separate from the Godhead in order to make enjoyment possible. But is God insentient like sugar? How can one surrender oneself and yet retain one's individuality for supreme enjoyment? Furthermore they also say that the soul, on reaching the divine region and remaining there, serves the supreme being. Can the sound of the word service deceive the Lord? Does he not know? Is he waiting for these people's services? Would he not, pure consciousness, ask in turn, Who are you apart from me that presume to serve me? If, on the other hand, you merge in the self there will be no individuality left. You will become the source itself. In that case what is surrender? Who is to surrender, and to whom? This constitutes devotion, wisdom and self-inquiry. Among the Vshnavites, too, Saint Namalwa says, I was in a maze, clinging to iron mine, I wandered without knowing myself. On realizing myself I understand that I myself am you and that mine, that is, my possessions, is only yours. Thus, you see, devotion is nothing more than knowing oneself. The school of qualified monism also admits it. Still, adhering to their traditional doctrine, they persist in affirming that individuals are part of the supreme, his limbs as it were. Their traditional doctrine says also that the individual soul should be made pure, and then surrendered to the supreme, then the ego is lost and one goes to the region of Vishnu after death. Then finally there is the enjoyment of the supreme, or the infinite to say that one is apart from the primal source is itself a pretension, to add that one divested of the ego becomes pure and yet retains individuality only to enjoy or serve the supreme is a deceitful stratagem. What duplicity this is, first to appropriate what is really his, and then pretend to experience or serve him. Is not all this known to him? It is obvious that surrender in the total uncompromising sense in which Bhagavan demands it is not easy. As often as one tries to surrender, the ego raises its head and one has to try to suppress it. Surrender is not an easy thing. Killing the ego is not an easy thing. It is only when God himself by his grace draws the mind inwards that complete surrender can be achieved. Dr. Said asked Bhagavan, doesn't total or complete surrender imply that even desire for liberation or God should be given up? b. Complete surrender does imply that you should have no desire of your own, that God's will alone is your will and you have no will of your own. Dr. S. Now that I am satisfied on that point, I want to know what are the steps by which I can achieve surrender. b. There are two ways, one is looking into the source of the I and merging into that source, the other is feeling I am helpless by myself. God alone is all powerful and except for throwing myself completely on him there is no other means of safety for me, and thus gradually developing the conviction that God alone exists and the ego does not count. Both methods lead to the same goal. Complete surrender is another name for jnana or liberation. However, partial surrender can come first and gradually become more and more complete. d. I find surrender impossible. b. Complete surrender is impossible in the beginning but partial surrender is possible for all. In course of time that will lead to complete surrender. The dualists may however object that the devotional path approved by Bhagavan is not that which they have in mind, since theirs presupposes the permanent duality of God and worshipper. In such cases, as in the last sentence of the following dialogue, Bhagavan would raise the discussion above theory, bidding them first achieve the surrender to a separate God, of which they spoke, and then see whether they had any further doubts. The state we call realization is simply being oneself, not knowing anything or becoming anything. If one has realized, then he is that which alone is and which alone has always been. He cannot describe that state. He can only be that. Of course we talk loosely of self-realization for want of a better term, but how is one to realize or make real that which alone is real? What we all are doing is realizing or regarding as real, 
that which is unreal. This habit has to be given up. All spiritual effort under all systems is directed only to this end. When we give up regarding the unreal as real, then reality alone will remain and we shall be that. The Swami replied, This exposition is all right in the framework of non-duality, but there are other schools which do not insist on the disappearance of the triad of Noah, knowledge and known as the condition for self-realization. There are schools which believe in the existence of two and even three eternal entities. There is the Bhakta, for instance. In order that he may worship there must be a god. B. Whoever objects to his having a separate god to worship so long as he needs one. Through devotion he develops until he comes to feel that god alone exists, and that he himself does not count. He comes to a stage when he says. Not I but thou, not my will, but thine. When that stage is reached, which is called complete surrender in Bhakti Marga, one finds that effacement of the ego is the attainment of the self. We need not quarrel whether there are two entities or more or only one. Even according to dualists and according to Bhakti Marga, complete surrender is necessary. Do that first and then see for yourself whether the one self alone exists or whether there are two or more. Bhagavan further added, Whatever may be said to suit the different capacities of different men, the truth is that the state of self-realization must be beyond the triad of knower, knowledge and known. The self is the self, that is all that can be said of it. The Swami then asked whether Ajnani could retain his body after attaining self-realization. He added, It is said that the impact of self-realization is so forceful that the weak physical body cannot bear it for more than twenty-one days at the longest. Bhagavan replied, What is your idea of Ajnani? Is he the body or something different? If he is something apart from the body, how can he be affected by the body? Books speak of different kinds of liberation, Vaidihan Mukti, without body, and Jivan Mukti, with body. There may be different stages on the path but there are no degrees of liberation. Sometimes Bhagavan was asked how the paths of love and knowledge could be the same since love postulates duality. d. Love postulates duality. How can the self be the object of love? b. Love is not different from the self. Love of an object is of a lower type and cannot endure, whereas the self is love. God is love. For those whose temperament and state of development demanded it, the Mahasi approved of ritualistic worship, which usually accompanies a devotional path. A visitor said to Bhagavan, Priests prescribe various rituals and forms of worship and people are told that it is a sin not to observe them. Is there any need for such ritual and ceremonial worship? B. Yes, such worship is also necessary. It may not help you, but that does not mean that it is necessary for no one and is no good at all. What is necessary for the infant is not necessary for the graduate. But even the graduate has to make use of the alphabet he learnt in the infant class. He knows its full use and significance. Worship might also take the form of concentration on one of the Hindu gods, that is one of the modes in which Hindus conceive of God. d. What are the steps of practical training? b. It depends on the qualifications and nature of the seeker. d. I worship an idol. b. Go on doing so. It leads to concentration of mind. Get one pointed. All will come right in the end. People think that liberation, moksha, is somewhere outside them to be sought for. They are wrong. It is only knowing the self in you. Concentrate, and you will get it. It is your mind that is the cycle of births and deaths, samsara. D. My mind is very unsteady. What should I do? B. Fix your attention on any single thing and try to hold on to it. Everything will come right. D. I find concentration difficult. B. Keep on practicing and your concentration will come to be as easy as breathing. That will be the crown of your achievement. However he did not approve of the desire to see visions, or in fact, any desire at all, even the desire for rapid realization. Miss Amadevi, 
a Polish lady who has become a Hindu, said to Sri Bhagavan. Once before I told Sri Bhagavan how I had a vision of Shiva at about the time I became a Hindu. A similar experience occurred to me at Cortlam. These visions are momentary, but they are blissful. I want to know how they can be made permanent and continuous. Without Shiva there is no life in what I see around me. I am so happy when I think of him. Please tell me how I can make the vision of him continuous. B, you speak of a vision of Shiva, but a vision always presumes an object. That implies the existence of a subject. The value of the vision is the same as that of the seer. That is to say, the nature of the vision is on the same plane as that of the seer. Appearance implies disappearance also. Therefore a vision can never be eternal. But Shiva is eternal. The vision of Shiva implies the existence of the eyes to see it, of the intellect behind the sight and finally of consciousness underlying the seer. This vision is not as real as one imagines it to be, because it is not intimate and inherent, it is not first hand. It is the result of several successive phases of consciousness. Consciousness alone does not vary. It is eternal. It is Shiva. A vision implies someone to see it, but this someone cannot deny the existence of the self. There is no moment when the self as consciousness does, not exist, nor can the seer remain apart from consciousness. This consciousness is the eternal being and is only being. The seer cannot see himself. Does he deny his existence because he cannot see himself as he sees a vision? No, so the true vision does not mean seeing but being. To be is to realize, hence I am that I am. I am is Shiva. Nothing else can be without him. Everything has its being in Shiva, because of Shiva. Therefore inquire, who am I? Sink deep within and abide as the self. That is Shiva as being. Do not expect to have visions of him repeated. What is the difference between the objects you see and Shiva? He is both subject and object. You cannot be without Shiva. Shiva is always realized, here and now. If you think you have not realized him you are wrong. That is the obstacle to realizing him. Give up that thought also and realization is there. D, yes, but how shall I effect it as quickly as possible? B, that is another obstacle to realization. Can there be an individual without Shiva? Even now he is you. There is no question of time. If there were a moment of non-realization, the question of realization could arise. But you cannot be without him. He is already realized, ever realized and never non-realized. Surrender to him and abide by his will, whether he appears or vanishes, await his pleasure. If you ask him to do as you please, it is not surrender but command. You cannot have him obey you and yet think you have surrendered. He knows what is best and when and how, leave everything entirely to him. The burden is his. You have no longer any cares. All your cares are his. That is surrender. That is bhakti. D. A vision of God is something glorious. B. A vision of God is only a vision of the self objectified as the God of your particular faith. What you have to do is to know the self. Bhagavan was often heard to say, to know God is to love God, therefore the paths of jnana and bhakti, knowledge and devotion, come to the same. Subject, Japa. Japa, that is the use of incantations and invocations of a divine name, is one of the most widely practiced techniques of spiritual training. It has particular affinity with the bhakti paths of love and devotion. The Maharshi approved of it, subject, of course, to the condition illustrated in the story of the king and his minister on page 93, that the person who practiced any incantation had been duly authorized to do so by a qualified guru. He himself occasionally authorized the use of invocations, but very seldom. The point is to keep out all other thoughts except the one thought of Amor Amor God. All incantations and invocations help to do that. The more devotion there is behind the words the better this is accomplished, and therefore the more effective is the incantation. d. When I invoke the divine name for an hour or more I fall into a state like sleep. 
On waking up I recollect that my invocation has been interrupted, so I try again. B, like sleep, that is right. It is the natural state. Because you now identify yourself with the ego, you look upon the natural state as something which interrupts your work. So you must have the experience repeated until you realize that it is your natural state. You will then find that the invocation is extraneous, but still it will go on automatically. Your present doubt is due to false identification of yourself with the mind that makes the invocation. Invocation really means clinging to one thought to the exclusion of all others. That is the purpose of it. It leads to absorption which ends in self-realization or jnana. D. How should I practice invocation? B. One should not use the name of God mechanically and superficially without a feeling of devotion. When one uses the name of God one should call on him with yearning and unreservedly surrender oneself to him. Only after such surrender is the name of God constantly with you. In its early stages an incantation may even be accompanied by visualization of the form of a guru or of a mythological form of God. D. My practice has been continuous invocation of the names of God while breathing in and of the names of Sai Baba while breathing out. Simultaneously with this I see the form of Baba always. Even in Bhagavan I see Baba. The external appearances are also much alike. Bhagavan is thin. Baba was a little stout. Should I continue this method or change it? Something within tells me that if I stick to name and form I shall never get beyond them but I can't understand what further to do if I gave them up. Will Bhagavan please enlighten me? B. You may continue with your present method. When the japa becomes continuous, all other thoughts cease and one is in one's real nature which is invocation or absorption. We turn our minds outwards to things of the world and are therefore not aware that our real nature is always invocation. When by conscious effort, or invocation, or meditation as we call it, we prevent our minds from thinking of other things, then what remains is our real nature, which is invocation. So long as you think you are name and form, you can't escape name and form in invocation. When you realize that you are not name and form, name and form will drop off themselves. No other effort is necessary. Invocation or meditation will lead to it naturally and as a matter of course. Invocation which is now regarded as the means, will then be found to be the goal. There is no difference between God and his name. As the above passage indicates, incantation merges with dhyana, which, for want of a better word, is translated meditation. For this reason, silent incantation is better than vocal, being more inward. D. Isn't mental invocation better than oral? B. Oral incantation consists of sounds. The sounds arise from thoughts, for one must think before one expresses one's thoughts in words. The thoughts form the mind. Therefore mental invocation is better than oral. D. Shouldn't we contemplate the invocation and repeat it orally also? B. When the invocation becomes mental, where is the need for sound? On becoming mental, it becomes contemplation. Meditation, contemplation and mental invocation are the same. When thoughts cease to be promiscuous and one thought persists to the exclusion of all others, it is said to be contemplation. The object of invocation or meditation is to exclude varied thoughts and confine oneself to one thought. Then that thought too vanishes into its source, which is pure consciousness or the self. The mind first engages in invocation and then sinks into its own source. This is certain, worship, incantations and meditation are performed respectively with the body, the voice and the mind and in this they are of ascending order of value. One can regard this eightfold universe as a manifestation of God, and whatever worship is performed in it is excellent as worship of God. The repetition aloud of his name is better than praise. Better still is its faint murmur. But the best is repetition with the mind, and that is meditation, above referred to. Better than such broken thoughts, meditation, is its steady and continuous flow like the flow of oil or of a perennial stream. Subject, 
Karma Marga. Little need be said here about Karma Marga, the path of action, since it has been dealt with in an earlier chapter. The Maharshi discouraged unnecessary activities on the one hand and the attempt to renounce activity on the other, enjoining performance of the necessary routine activities of life in a detached manner, simultaneously with the practice of inquiry or devotion. D. Swami, how can the grip of the ego be loosened? B. By not adding new vasanas, innate tendencies, to it. D. How does activity help? Will it not add to the already heavy load that has to be removed? b. Actions performed with no thought of the ego purify the mind and help to fix it in meditation. d. But suppose one were to meditate incessantly without activity? b. Try and see. Your innate tendencies will not let you. Meditation, Diana, comes only step by step with the weakening of innate tendencies by the grace of the Guru.1. Methods graded. Although the Maharshi recognized all methods, he graded them as more or less direct and effective, as is shown in the above quotation of verses 4 to 7 of the Essence of Instruction. The following exposition also makes this clear. Examination of the ephemeral nature of external things leads to dispassion, ver irogyur. Hence inquiry is the first and most important step. When it becomes automatic, it results in indifference to wealth fame, ease, pleasure and so on. The I thought is traced to the source of the I in the heart, which is the final goal. However, if the aspirant is temperamentally unsuited for self-inquiry, he must develop devotion. It may be to God or Guru or mankind in general or ethical laws or even an ideal of beauty. As any of these takes possession of him, other attachments grow weaker and dispassion develops. Attachment to the object of devotion grows until it dominates him completely, and with it grows concentration, ekagrata, with or without visions and direct aids. If neither inquiry nor devotion appeals to him, he can gain tranquility by breath control. This is the way of yoga. If a man's life is in danger, all his interest centers round the one point of saving it. If the breath is held, the mind cannot afford to jump out at its beloved outer objects, and it does not do so. Therefore there is peace of mind as long as the breath is held. Since all one's attention is concentrated on the breath, other interests are abandoned. Then also, any passion results in irregular breathing. A paroxysm of joy is in fact as painful as one of grief, and both result in disturbed breathing. Real peace is happiness, and pleasures do not produce happiness. If the aspirant is unsuited to the first two methods by temperament and to the third on account of age or health, he must try karma marga, the path of good deeds and social service. His nobler instincts are thus developed and he derives personal happiness from his actions. His ego becomes less assertive and its good side is enabled to develop. He thus in course of time comes to be suited for one of the three former paths or his intuition may be developed by Karma Marga alone. Chapter 7, The Goal D. What is the purpose of self-realization? B. Self-realization is the final goal and is itself the purpose. D. I mean, what use is it? B. Why do you ask about self-realization? Why don't you rest content with your present state? It is evident that you are discontented and your discontent will come to an end if you realize the self. The above question was seldom asked, because those who came to the Maharshi usually understood at least that the state of spiritual ignorance, or, as Christianity puts it, of fallen man, is undesirable and that self-realization is the supreme goal. In the following dialogue the purpose is asked with more understanding and therefore the answer also goes deeper. d. What is the goal of this process? b. Realizing the real. d. What is the nature of reality? b. a. Existence without beginning or end eternal. b. Existence everywhere, endless infinite. c. Existence underlying all forms, all changes, all forces, all matter and all spirit. The many change and pass away, 
whereas the one always endures. D. The one displaces the triads such as knower, knowledge and known. The triads are only appearances in time and space, whereas the reality lies beyond and behind them. They are like a mirage over the reality. They are the result of delusion. D. If I am also an illusion, who casts off the illusion? B. The I casts off the illusion of I and yet remains I. Such is the paradox of self realization. The realized do not see any contradiction in it. One. It is surprising how many philosophers and theologians have failed to understand what is implied by self realization and have misrepresented and even attacked or belittled it. All that it means, as Bhagavan explains in the passage just quoted, is realizing reality, realizing what is. And reality remains the same, eternal and unchanging, whether one realizes it or not. One can, of course, understand the annoyance and frustration of philosophers who wish to grasp everything with the mind on being told that reality lies beyond and behind the triad of knower knowledge known, which is like a mirage over it, for obviously the mirage cannot penetrate to that which underlies it. That is why no easy answer can be given to them. Indeed, Bhagavan did not on the whole approve of questions about the meaning and nature of realization because his purpose was to help the questioner and not to satisfy mental curiosity. He usually reminded people that what is needed is effort to attain self-knowledge, and when that is attained, the questions will not arise. Some people who come here don't ask me about themselves but about the Jivan Mukta, liberated while still embodied. Does he see the world? Is he subject to destiny? Can one be liberated only after leaving the body or while yet alive? Should the body of a sage resolve itself into light or disappear from sight in a miraculous way? Can one who leaves a corpse behind at death be liberated? Their questions are endless. Why worry about all these things? Does liberation consist in knowing the answer to these questions? So I tell them, never mind about liberation. First find out whether there is such a thing as bondage. Examine yourself first. He sometimes pointed out that even to speak of self-realization is a delusion an illusory escape from an illusory prison. b. In a sense, speaking of self-realization is a delusion. It is only because people have been under the delusion that the non-self is the self and the unreal the real, that they have to be weaned out of it by the other delusion called self-realization, because actually the self always is the self and there is no such thing as realizing it. Who is to realize what, and how, when all that exists is the self and nothing but the self? One thing which impedes understanding, especially in theologians is the contrast between self-realization and sainthood and the mistaken idea that it may represent a difference between various religious traditions, one striving for sainthood and another for realization. This idea is quite ungrounded. There have been saints in every religion, Hinduism as well as others. They differ very much among themselves, both in individual characteristics, from the rapturous to the serene, from the austere to the benign from the subtle philosopher to the simple-minded, and also in degree of attainment, some of them possess supernatural powers, some are swept away in ecstatic bliss, some consume themselves in loving service to mankind, all have a purity beyond that of ordinary men. Their state may be called heavenly even while on earth. And yet all this falls short of self-realization. All this is in the state of duality where God or self is the other, where prayer is necessary, and revelation possible. In strict theory they are as far removed as the ordinary man from self-realization, since there is no common measure between the absolute and the conditioned, the infinite and the limited. A million is no nearer to infinity than a hundred. This complete gulf is illustrated by the Buddhist story of the man who wanders about the earth seeking for a lost jewel which all the time is on his brow. When at last it is pointed out to him, all his years of search and wandering have done nothing to bring him nearer to it. And yet, in actual fact, if he had not gone searching he would not have found it. 
and in actual fact the scent can be considered nearer to realization than ordinary men, just as it is easier for an ordinary man to attain realization than for a dog. Although both alike are limited to the illusion of individual being, there are stages of attainment of the saints, just as there is a hierarchy of heavens, and both of these correspond to the degrees of initiation in indirect spiritual paths. Bhagavan would answer questions about this when specifically asked, but did not usually speak of it, since his purpose was not to raise his followers from grade to grade of apparent reality but to direct them towards the one eternal, universal, reality. D. Do we go to Svarga, heaven, as a result of our actions here? B. Heaven is as real as your present life. But if we ask who we are and discover the self, what need is there to think of heaven? D. Is Vikanta, heaven, in the Supreme Self? B. Where is the Supreme Self or heaven unless in you? D. But heaven may appear to one involuntarily. B. Does this world appear voluntarily? Similarly he would briefly acknowledge grades of development in the individual but would not dwell on them. The yogic centers counting from the bottom upwards, are a series of centers in the nervous system, each having its own kind of power or knowledge. When someone told him about a present day saint who was said to be constantly inspired by an incarnation of God and to speak only as divinely directed, and he asked him whether this was true or not, he replied. As true as all this that you see around you. For, as compared with the self, neither this physical world nor any higher world is inherently real, just as, compared with infinity, a big number has no more meaning than a small one. Ascent may attain a lofty grade without even conceiving of the ultimate reality of oneness or having only brief ecstatic intimations of it. That does not matter, the power of his purity and aspiration will eventually sweep him onwards either in this life or beyond. For one who envisages the ultimate goal and strives towards it there are no stages, either he is realized or he is not. About this Bhagavan spoke willingly and explicitly, because this was the path he enjoined. There are no stages in realization or mukti. There are no degrees of liberation. D. There must be stage after stage of progress before attaining the absolute. Are there different levels of reality? B. There are no levels of reality, there are only levels of experience for the individual, not of reality. If anything can be gained which was not the before, it can also be lost, whereas the absolute is eternal, here and now. However, although there are no stages of self-realization there are what might be called previews, glimpses which are not yet stabilized or made permanent. Sometimes, indeed, these occur to people who, in this lifetime, have had no spiritual training at all. As the opacity of the aspirant's ego lessens with training in abnegation he becomes more liable to them. Even great mystic philosophers such as Plotinus or Meister Eckhart have, by their own admission, been dependent on them, not having attained to the permanent state of identity from which Bhagavan taught. Can a man become a high official merely by seeing one? He may become one only if he strives and equips himself for the position. Similarly, can the ego, which is in bondage as the mind, become the divine self simply because it has once glimpsed that it is the self? Is this not impossible without the destruction of the mind? Can a beggar become a king by merely visiting a king and declaring himself to be one? d. Can self-realization be lost again after once being attained? b. Realization takes time to steady itself. The self is certainly within the direct experience of everyone but not in the way people imagine. One can only say that it is as it is. Just as incantations or other devices can prevent fire from burning a man when otherwise it would do so, so the sanas, inherent tendencies impelling one to desire one thing and to shun another, can veil the self when otherwise it would be apparent. Owing to the fluctuations of the Vasanas, realization takes time to steady itself. Spasmodic realization is not enough to prevent rebirth, but it cannot become permanent as long as there are Vasanas. In the presence of a great master, Vasanas cease to be active and the mind becomes still so that Samadhi, 
absorption in realization, results, just as in the presence of various devices fire does not burn. Thus the disciple gains true knowledge and right experience in the presence of a master. But if this is to be established further effort is necessary. Then he will know it to be his real being and thus be liberated while still living. Some armchair critics have claimed that the quest of self-realization is arrogant or presumptuous or does not involve the humility and self-effacement of sainthood. If, instead of theorizing, they undertook the eradication of the vasanas, which are the roots of the ego, they would soon see. Actually it is beyond both arrogance and humility, beyond all pairs of opposites, it is simply what is. It involves not merely the humbling of the ego but its complete dissolution. You are the self even now, but you confuse your present consciousness or ego with the absolute consciousness or self. This false identification is due to ignorance, and ignorance disappears together with the ego. Killing the ego is the only thing to be done. Realization already exists, no attempt need be made to attain it. For it is not anything external or new to be acquired. It is always and everywhere here and now, too. d. This method seems to be quicker than the usual one of cultivating the virtues alleged to be necessary for realization. b. Yes. All vices center around the ego. When the ego is gone realization results naturally. Having spoken of the saint and the mystic philosopher, mention should also be made of the occultist, that is the person who seeks realization for the sake of the supernatural powers it may bring. This Bhagavan always discouraged. Realization may bring powers with it, as the higher includes the lower, but desire for powers will impede realization, as the quest for the lower state negates the higher. If the objective is the endowment of the ego with new powers, how can it at the same time be the liquidation of the ego? Such a person has not understood what realization means. d. What are the powers of supermen? b. Whether the powers are high or low, whether of the mind or what you call the supermind, they exist only with reference to him who possesses them. Find out who that is. b. He that would abide in the self should never swerve from his one-pointed attention to the self or the pure being that he is. If he slips or swerves away from that state, several kinds of vision conjured up by the mind may be seen, but one should not be misled by such visions which may be of light or space nor by the nada or subtle sounds that may be heard, nor by the visions of a personified God, seen either within oneself or outwardly, as if they had an objective reality. One should not mistake any of these things for the reality. When the principle of intellection by which these visions and so on are cognized or perceived is itself false or illusory, how can the objects thus cognized, much less the visions perceived, be real? There are some foolish persons who, not realizing that they themselves are moved by the divine power, seek to attain all supernatural power of action. They are like the lame man who said, I can dispose of the enemy if someone will hold me up on my legs. Since peace of mind is permanent in liberation, how can they who yoke their mind to powers which are unattainable except through the activity of the mind become merged in the bliss of liberation which subdues the agitation of the mind? d. Can a yogi know his past lives? b. Do you know the present life so well that you wish to know the past? Find the present, then the rest will follow. Even with your present limited knowledge, you suffer much. Why should you burden yourself with more knowledge? Is it so as to suffer more? d. Does Bhagavan use occult powers to make others realize the self or is the mere fact of Bhagavan's realization enough for that? b. The spiritual force of realization is far more powerful than the use of all occult powers. Inasmuch as there is no ego in the sage there are no others for him. What is the highest benefit that can be conferred on you? It is happiness, and happiness is born of peace. Peace can reign only where there is no disturbance, and disturbance, is due to thoughts that arise in the mind. When the mind is itself absent, there will be perfect peace. Unless a person has annihilated the mind, he cannot gain peace and be happy. And unless he himself is happy, 
he cannot bestow happiness on others. Since, however, there are no others for the sage, who has no mind, the mere fact of his self-realization is itself enough to make the others happy too. When asked if occult powers, Siddhis, can be achieved with the divine state, is Varatva, as mentioned in the last verse of Dakshinamurthy Stotra, the Maharshi said, let the divine state be achieved first, and then the other questions may be raised. No powers can extend into self-realization, so how can they extend beyond it? People who desire powers are not content with their idea of pure consciousness. They are inclined to neglect the supreme happiness of realization for the sake of powers. In search of these they follow by lanes instead of the high road and so risk losing their way. In order to guide them right and keep them on the high road, they are told that powers accompany realization. In fact realization comprises everything and the realized man will not waste a thought on powers. Let people first get realization and then seek powers if they still want to. Powers may accrue before or after attaining realization, or they may not, according to the nature of the person, but they are not to be valued or sought after, nor is their absence or the absence of visions or other such experiences to be taken as a cause for discouragement on the path. D. Is it not necessary or at least advantageous to render the body invisible in oneness spiritual progress? B. Why do you think of that? Are you the body? D. No. But advanced spirituality must effect a change in the body, mustn't it? B. What change do you desire in the body, and why? D. Isn't he invisibility evidence of advanced wisdom, Jnana? B. In that case all those who spoke and wrote and passed their lives in the sight of others must be considered ignorant, Ajnanis, d. But the sage is Vasish to and Varmiki possessed such powers. b. It may have been their destiny, Prarabdha, to develop such powers, Siddhis, side by side with their wisdom, Jnana. Why should you aim at that which is not essential but is apt to prove a hindrance to wisdom, Jnana? Does the sage, Jnani, feel oppressed by his body being visible? d. No. b. A hypnotist can suddenly render himself invisible. Is he therefore a sage? d. No. b. Visibility and invisibility refer to him who sees. Who is that? Solve that question first. Other questions are unimportant. An American visitor was discouraged at having attained no powers. d. I have been interesting myself in metaphysics for over twenty years, but I have not gained any novel experiences as so many others claim to. I have no powers of clairvoyance, clairaudience, and so on. I feel locked up in this body, nothing more. B, that is all right. Reality is only one and that is the self. All other things are mere phenomena in it, of it and by it. Seer, sight and seen are all the self only. Can anyone see or hear without the self? What difference does it make if you see or hear anyone close up or at a great distance? The organs of sight and hearing are needed in both cases. So is the mind. None of them can be dispensed with. In either case you are dependent on them. Why then should there be any glamour about clairvoyance or clairaudience? Moreover, what is acquired will also be lost in due course. It can never be permanent. The only permanent thing is reality and that is the self. You say, I am, I am going, I am speaking, I am working, and so on. Kaiftanate the I am in all of them. Thus, I am. That is the abiding and fundamental reality. This truth was taught by God to Moses, I am that I am, be still and know that I am God, so I am is God. From what has been said up to here it will be seen that self-realization is the most simple and natural thing, in fact the only simple and natural thing, simply the state of being that which is, and yet it is a state most rare, unknown to the saints, glimpsed briefly by the mystics. Among thousands there is perhaps one who strives to be perfect. Among thousands who strive to be perfect there is perhaps one who knows me as I am. Bhagavad Gita, 7-3
Unfortunately it is a sign of our times that attainment of this supreme state is falsely claimed for many. The aspirant needs to discriminate. Once attained, the supreme state must be the same by whatever path and whatever religion it was approached, being, by its very nature, beyond differentiation. Once attained, the state of self-realization is the same by whatever path and in whatever religion it may be approached. There are three aspects of God, according to one's approach to realization. They are, Sat, Being, Chit, Consciousness, Ananda, Bliss. The aspect of being is emphasized by Jnanis who are said to repose in the essence of being after incessant search and to have their individuality lost in the Supreme. The consciousness aspect is approached by yogis who exert themselves to control their breath in order to steady the mind and are then said to see the glory, consciousness of being, of God as the one light radiating in all directions. The beatitude aspect is approached by devotees who become intoxicated with the nectar of love of God and lose themselves in blissful experience. Unwilling to leave this, they remain forever merged in God. The four margas, karma, Bhakti, Yoga and Jnana are not exclusive of one another. They are described separately in classical works only to convey an idea of the appropriate aspect of God to appeal readily to the aspirant according to his predisposition. Experience of realization is known as Samadhi. It is often supposed that Samadhi implies trance, but that is not necessarily so. It is also possible to be in a state of samadhi while retaining full possession of human faculties. In fact, a self-realized sage such as the Mahasi dwells permanently in this state. Even the pre-glimpses of realization spoken of earlier do not necessarily imply trance. The Sanyasi visitor, Swami Lokasananda, asked about samadhi, b. 1. Holding on to reality is samadhi. 2. Holding on to Samadhi with effort is Savakalpa Samadhi. 3. Merging in reality and remaining unaware of the world is Nirvikalpa Samadhi. 4. Merging in ignorance and remaining unaware of the world is sleep. 5. Remaining in the primal, pure, natural state without effort is Saha Nirvikalpa Samadhi. He old gentleman asked Bhagavan whether it was not necessary to go through Nirvikalpa Samadhi first before attaining to Seha Samadhi. Bhagavan replied, when we have tendencies that we are trying to give up, that is to say when we are still imperfect and have to make conscious efforts to keep the mind one-pointed or free from thought, the thoughtless state which we thus attain is Nirvikalpa Samadhi. When, through practice, we are always in that state, not going into Samadhi and coming out again, that is the Seha state. In the Seha state one sees only the self and one sees the world as a form assumed by the self. The question of the nature of Samadhi brings with it the question of activity. Uselessly trying to imagine what Samadhi is or what realization implies, instead of striving to attain it, people form theories as to whether the realized man can be active or not. D. Can a man who has attained realization move about and act and speak? B. Why not? Do you suppose realization means being inert like a stone, or becoming nothing? D. I don't know, but they say that the highest state is withdrawal from all sense activities, thoughts and experiences, in fact, cessation of activity. B. Then how would it differ from deep sleep? Besides, it would be a state which, however exalted, comes and goes and would therefore not be the natural and normal state, so how could it represent the eternal presence of the Supreme Self, which persists through all states, and survives them? It is true that there is such a state and that in the case of some people it may be necessary to go through it. It may be a temporary phase of the quest or it may persist to the end of the man's life, if it be the divine will or the man's destiny, but in any case, you cannot call it the highest state. If it were, you would have to say that not only the sages, but God himself has not attained the highest state, since not only are the realized sages very active but the personal God, Isvara, himself is obviously not in this supremely inactive state, 
since he presides over the world and directs its activities. d. What is Samadhi? b. In yoga the term is used to indicate some kind of trance and there are various kinds of Samadhi. But the Samadhi I speak to you about is different. It is Seha Samadhi. In this state you remain calm and composed during activity. You realize that you are moved by the deeper real self within and are unaffected by what you do or say or think. You have no worries, anxieties or cares, for you realize that there is nothing that belongs to you as ego and that everything is being done by something with which you are in conscious union. After realization, a man may continue a life of worldly activity or he may not, it makes no difference to his state. A visitor said, realized men generally withdraw from active life and abstain from worldly activity. b. They may or they may not. Some, even after realization, carry on trade or business or rule a kingdom. Some withdraw to solitary places and abstain from all activity more than the minimum necessary to keep life in the body. We cannot make any general rule about it. Inability to understand the apparent inactivity of the sage is one of the difficulties of many Western writers. Firmly convinced that Christ was mistaken in saying that Mary had chosen the better part, modern Christians are apt to represent Martha, the outwardly active one, as superior and to criticize the sage for what they consider inaction. When asked by an aspirant whether his realization, if attained, would help others, Bhagavan has been known to reply. Yes, and it is the best help you possibly can give them. But then he added. But in fact there are no others to help. The same paradox is proclaimed in Buddhism where, for instance in the Diamond Sutra, after speaking of compassion, the Buddha explains that in reality there are no others to be compassionate to. The Lord Buddha continued, Do not think, Sabuti, that the Tathagata, that is, the Buddha, would consider within himself, I will deliver human beings. That would be a degrading thought. Why? Because there are really no sentient beings to be delivered by the Tathagata. Should there be any sentient beings to be delivered by the Tathagata, it would mean that the Tathagata was cherishing within his mind arbitrary conceptions of phenomena such as one's own self, other selves, living beings and a universal self. Even when the Tathagata refers to himself, he is not holding within his mind any such arbitrary thought. Only terrestrial human beings think of selfhood as being a personal possession. Sabuti, even the expression terrestrial beings as used by the Tathagata does not mean that there are any such beings. It is only used as a figure of speech. People often say that a realized man should go about preaching his message. They ask how a man can remain quiet in realization when there is misery also existing. But what is a realized man? Does he see misery outside himself? They want to determine his state without themselves realizing it. From his standpoint their contention amounts to this, a man has a dream in which he sees a number of persons. On waking up he asks, have the people in the dream also woken up? Question mark it is ridiculous. Again, some good man says, it does not matter even if I don't get realization. Let me be the last man in the world to get it so that I can help all the others to become realized before I do. That is just like the dreamer saying, let all these people in the dream wake up before I do. He would be no more absurd than this amiable philosopher. And yet, paradoxically, the sage is intensely active, although he may apparently be inactive. A saying of lots from the Tao Tse Ching was read out in the hall, by his non-action. The sage governs all. Sri Bhagavan remarked, non action is unceasing activity. The sage is characterized by eternal and incessant activity. His stillness is like the apparent stillness of a fast rotating top. It is moving too fast for the eye to see, so it appears to be still. Yet it is rotating. So is the apparent inaction of the sage. This has to be explained because people generally mistake his stillness for inertness. It is not so. Similar to this preoccupation with action was the question of whether the realized man is bound by destiny. 
really the question has no meaning. His body is bound by destiny but, since he does not identify himself with the body, its destiny cannot bind him. Being one with the eternal self within which this body, his life, this world, passes like an appearance, he cannot be bound by anything. This morning a visitor said to Bhagavan, the realized man has no karma, he is not bound by destiny, so why should he still retain a body? Question mark. B, who asks this question a realized man or an unrealized man? Why worry about what the realized man does or why he does anything? Better think about yourself. He was then silent. After a while, however, he explained further, you are under the impression that you are the body, so you think the realized man also has a body. Does he say that he has one? He may seem to you to have one, and to do things with it, as others do. The char dashes of a rope look like a rope but they are of no use to tie anything with. So long as one identifies oneself with the body, all this is hard to understand. That is why it is sometimes said in answer to such questions that the body of the realized man continues to exist until his destiny has worked itself out, and then it falls away. An example of this that is sometimes given is that an arrow which has been loosed from the bow, destiny, must continue its course and hit the mark, even though the animal that stood there has moved away and another has taken its place, that is, realization has been achieved. But the truth is that the realized man has transcended all destiny and is bound neither by the body nor by its destiny. Equally beside the point is the question of whether the realized man can feel pain or pleasure, if pleasure, then pain also, because the two go together, they are a pair of opposites. The sensation is common both to the realized man and the unrealized man. The difference is that the unrealized man identifies himself with the body that feels it, whereas the realized man knows that all this is self, all this is Brahman. If there is pain, let it be. It is also a part of the self and the self is perfect. Or whether he can commit sins. The very raising of this question implies failure to understand what is meant by self-realization. Sin is the action of the ego or the individual being in its own interests against the universal harmony or the will of God. But where there is no ego, where there is only the universal self, who is to act against whom? An unrealized man sees one who is realized and identifies him with the body. Because he does not know the self and mistakes the body for the self, he extends the same mistake to the body of the realized man. The latter is therefore considered to be the physical form. Again, the unrealized man, though in fact not the originator of his actions, imagines himself to be so, and he considers the actions of the body as his own actions, and therefore he thinks that the realized man is acting in the same way, because his body is active. But the latter knows the truth and is not deceived. His state cannot be understood by the unrealized and therefore the question of his actions troubles the latter although it does not arise for himself. All good or divine qualities are included in jnana, spiritual enlightenment, and all bad or satanic qualities in ajnana, spiritual darkness. When jnana comes all ajnana goes, so that all divine qualities come automatically. If a man is a jnani he cannot utter lies or commit any sin. The saying that there is no ego or that the mind is dead sometimes leads to misunderstandings. What is meant is simply that the mind or ego as apparent creator or originator of policies, plans and ideas, is dead. Understanding remains, and pure radiant consciousness, d, can we think without the mind? b, thoughts can continue like other activities. They do not disturb the supreme consciousness. People surmise the existence of the pure mind in the Jivanmukta and the personal God. They ask how he could otherwise live and act. But this is only a concession to argument. The pure mind is in fact absolute consciousness. The object to be witnessed and the witness finally merge together and absolute consciousness alone remains. It is not a state of blank or ignorance but it is the supreme self. The mind of the realized man is sometimes compared to the moon and daytime. 
the moon shines by reflecting the light of the sun. When the sun has set, the moon is useful for displaying objects. When the sun has risen, no one needs the moon, although its disk is visible in the sky. So it is with the mind and the heart. The mind is made useful by its reflected light. It is used for seeing objects. When turned inwards, it merges into the source of illumination which shines by itself and the mind is then like the moon in daytime. Sometimes people expressed fear at the thought of giving up the ego, but Bhagavan reminded them that they do so every time they go to sleep. People are afraid that when the ego or the mind is killed, the result may be a mere blank and not happiness. What really happens is that the thinker, the object of thought and thinking all merge in the one source which is consciousness and bliss itself, and thus that state is neither inert nor blank. I don't understand why people should be afraid of a state in which all thoughts cease to exist and the mind is killed. They daily experience it in sleep. There is no mind or thought in sleep. Yet when one rises from sleep one says, I slept well. Moreover, in sleep they surrender the ego in order to lapse into a mere blank, whereas realization is merging into pure consciousness which is the uttermost bliss. In answer to a visitor, Bhagavan made the following remark, you can have, or rather you will yourself be, the highest imaginable kind of happiness. All other kinds of happiness which you have spoken of as pleasure, joy, happiness, bliss, are only reflections of the ananda which, in your true nature, you are. It is impossible to describe Samadhi since it transcends the mind. It can only be experienced. An American lady asked Bhagavan what his experiences of Samadhi were, when it was suggested that she should relate her experiences and ask if they were right, she replied that Sri Bhagavan's experiences ought to be correct and should be known whereas her own were unimportant. She wanted to know whether Sri Bhagavan felt his body hot or cold in Samadhi, whether he spent the first three and a half years of his stay in Tiruvannamalai in prayer, and so on. B. Samadhi transcends mind and speech and cannot be described. The state of deep sleep cannot be described, the state of say maddy even less. D. But I know that I was unconscious in deep sleep. B. Consciousness and unconsciousness are modes of the mind. Say maddy transcends the mind. D. Still, you can tell me what it is like. B. You will know only when you are in say maddy. Sometimes he referred to the cinema screen as an illustration. D. If the realized and the unrealized alike perceive the world, where is the difference between them? b. When the realized man sees the world, he sees the self that is the substratum of all that is seen. Whether the unrealized man sees the world or not, he is ignorant of his true being, the self. Take the example of a film on a cinema screen. What is there in front of you before the film begins? Only the screen. On that screen you see the entire show, and to all appearances the pictures are real. But go and try to take hold of them and what do you take hold of? The screen on which the pictures appear so real. After the play, when the pictures disappear, what remains? The screen again. So it is with the self. That alone exists, the pictures come and go. If you hold on to the self, you will not be deceived by the appearance of the pictures. Nor does it matter at all whether the pictures appear or disappear. Once permanent, unwavering Seha or Samadhi has been obtained, this is the state of Mukti or liberation. People speak of Jivan Mukti and Vaidihan Mukti, that is liberation while still living and liberation after death, but Bhagavan explained that the difference is only from the point of view of the observer. To the realized man himself it makes no difference whether he wears a body or not. Mr. Banerjee asked Bhagavan what is the difference between Jivan Mukti and Vaidhiha Mukti. B. There is no difference. For those who ask it is said that a realized man with a body is a Jivan Mukti and that he attains Vaidhiha Mukti when he sheds the body, but this difference exists only for the onlooker, not for him. His state is the same before shedding the body, and after. We think of him as a human form or as in that form, but he knows that he is the self, 
the one reality, both inner and outer, which is not bound by any form. There is a verse in the Bhagavata, Bhagavan here quoted the verse in Tamil, which says that just as a drunken man does not notice whether he is wearing his shawl or whether it has fallen off, so the realized man is hardly aware of his body and it makes no difference to him whether it remains or drops off. There are no stages in realization or mukti. There are no degrees of liberation. So there cannot be one stage of liberation with the body and another when the body has been shed. The realized man knows that he is the self and that nothing, neither his body nor anything else, exists but the self. To such a one what difference could the presence or absence of a body make? Sometimes realization is called Tariya, the fourth state, because it underlies the three states of waking, dream and deep sleep. When I entered the hall Bhagavan was answering some questions and was saying, there is no difference between the dream and waking states except that the former is short and the latter long. Both are the product of the mind. Because the waking state lasts longer we imagine it to be our real state, but actually our real state is what is sometimes called the fourth state, which is always as it is, and is unaffected by waking, dream or sleep. Because we call these three states we call that a state also, however, it is really just the natural state of the self. A fourth state would imply something relative, whereas this is transcendent. In truth, there is no bondage. Our real nature is liberation, but we imagine that we are bound and we make strenuous efforts to get free, although all the while we are free. This is understood only when we reach that state. Then we shall be surprised to find that we were frantically striving to attain something that we always were and are. An illustration will make this clear. A man goes to sleep in this hall. He dreams he has gone on a world tour and is traveling over hill and dale, forest and plain, desert and sea, across various continents, and after many years of weary and strenuous travel, he returns to this country, reaches Tyru Van Amalai, enters the ashram and walks into the hall. Just at that moment he wakes up and finds that he has not moved at all but has been sleeping where he lay down. He has not returned after great efforts to this hall, but was here all the time. It is exactly like that. If it is asked why, being free, we imagine ourselves bound, I answer, why, being in the hall, did you imagine you were on a world tour, crossing hill and dale, desert and sea question mark it is all mind or maya. 8. Under whatever name and form one may worship the absolute reality it is only a means for realizing it which is without name and form. That alone is true realization, wherein one knows oneself in relation to that reality, attains peace and realizes oneness identity with it. 9. The duality of subject and object, the trinity of seer, sight and seen, can exist only if supported by the one. If one turns inwards in search of that one reality, they fall away. Those who see this are those who see wisdom. They are never in doubt. 21. What is the truth of the scriptures which declare that if one sees the self, one sees God? How can one see oneness self? If, since one is a single being, one cannot see oneness self, how can one see God? Only by becoming a prey to him. 22. The divine gives light to the mind and shines within it. Except by turning the mind inward and fixing it in the divine, there is no other way to know him through the mind. 30. If one inquires who am I question mark within the mind, the individual I falls down abashed as soon as one reaches the heart and immediately reality manifests itself spontaneously as I I. Although it reveals itself as the I, it is not the ego but the perfect being, the absolute self. 31. For him who is immersed in the bliss of the self, arising from the extinction of the ego, what remains to be accomplished? He is not aware of anything other than the self. Who can comprehend his state? 32. Although the scriptures proclaim thou art that, is only a sign of weakness of mind to meditate, I am that, not this, because you are eternally that. 
what has to be done is to investigate what one really is and remain as that. 33. It is ridiculous either to say I have not realized the self or I have realized the self, are there two selves for one to be the object of the other's realization? It is a truth within the experience of everyone that there is only one self. 34. It is due to illusion born of ignorance that men fail to recognize that which is always and for everybody the inherent reality dwelling in its natural heart center and to abide in it, and that instead they argue that it exists or it does not exist, that it has form or does not have form, or is non-dual or dual. 35. To seek and abide in the reality that is always attained is the only attainment. All other attainments, Siddhis, are such as are acquired in dreams. Can they that are established in the reality and are free from Maya, be deluded by them? 38. As long as a man is the doer, he also reaps the fruits of his deeds, but as soon as he realizes the self through inquiry as to who is the doer, his sense of being the doer falls away and the triple karma is ended, this is the state of eternal liberation. 39. Only so long as one considers oneself bound, do thoughts of bondage and liberation continue. When one inquires who is bound question mark the self is realized, eternally attained, eternally free. When thoughts of bondage comes to an end, can thoughts of liberation survive? 40. If it is said that liberation is of three kinds, with form, without form, on with and without form, then let me tell you that the extinction of the ego that asks which form of liberation is true, is the only true liberation. The end of Ramana Maharshi's book, in his own words.